300 years ago, Easter Island had a different name. They called it Rapa Nui. As boys, they had been friends. <laughs> but theirs was a divided world, where the privileged made the rules. I only believe in what I can see, in what I can feel, and what I don't have. We were friends once. As men, they would compete. If he loses the race. For the right to lead their people. This is our chance. You must help me do the impossible and to win the woman that they both loved. How bad do you want to win? More than anything. Enough to see him sacrificed? Jason Scott Lee, Isai Morales, and Sandrine Holt. Help me! Help me! Help me! The strength of their passions would determine the fate of paradise. Rapa Nui. set out to navigate the globe. Groups of Polynesian explorers were sailing their open outriggers across the Pacific in search of new lands. It is believed that one such group, led by the great chief Hotumatua, followed the rising sun and found a small volcanic island 2,300 miles west of present-day South America. This clan of 300 men, women, and children planted the seeds of a colony that would one day grow to nearly 20,000 people. In the span of a thousand years, they would develop one of the most advanced civilizations in all of Polynesia on 65 square miles of tropical paradise named Rapa Nui. With the arrival of Dutch explorer Jakob Rogeveen on Easter Sunday, 1722, there were no more than a handful of survivors living in caves on an arid, barren rock he renamed Easter Island. The only sign of the civilization that had once flourished there were hundreds of immense stone carvings littering the landscape, which the natives called Moai. These solemn-faced statues now stood abandoned in the quarry or toppled from altars, their necks broken and bearing the scars of both great social upheaval and natural disaster. For years to come, the tragic events that occurred here would be left to the imagination of the world. Easter Island is the most remote inhabited place on Earth. 
originally referred to as Tepitu Teheanua, translated to mean both the end of the land and the navel of the world. Its people have survived Peruvian slave traders, disease brought in from Western whalers, and English sheep ranchers whose pasture walls often desecrated sacred sites. Officially a part of Chile since 1888, life for its nearly 3,000 Spanish-speaking residents remains closely tied to the traditions, customs, and pace of its Polynesian past. And despite access by jet, airplane, and ocean liner, influence from the modern world has been minimal. One, two, three, two. Until now, an international group of filmmakers has come to Easter Island to create a truly unique motion picture. So right now, before we even do the camera move, I want to, on action, I want to hear the crowd react, booing and jeering. <laughs> Director Kevin Reynolds follows up on his hugely successful 1991 film, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Camera's rolling. With Rapa Nui, an epic story he first conceived 15 years ago. I took the legends and the things that are supposed to have happened here and um, sort of extrapolate on it as far as what I think people probably really did and try to fill in the blanks. Rapa Nui tells the story of two lovers from different classes whose relationship is jeopardized by the laws of taboo. Around this, Reynolds weaves a tale of social unrest, rebellion, and ultimately the destruction of an entire culture. When I first came here two years ago to see the place, I just came with the intention of, of research, just to see it firsthand, and then go out and make the picture somewhere else. Because I figured it was too remote, I could never do the picture here. But after I came here and I saw the quarry, and I saw Arango, and uh, just the landscape and the sky, so I can't make it anywhere else. And I'm glad we made that choice. But because of the logistical problems of mounting a large-scale film production on such a remote location, Reynolds needed strong allies to provide the money and support that would be required. He found them in Robin Hood star Kevin Costner and his producing partner, Jim Wilson. And cut! 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 I think most of us have seen the image of the Moai on the, on the mountain. I know I had. And then to have it wrapped in a theatrical story was just, um, it was just too tempting for me as a guy who likes movies. There is something about telling a piece of history, yet we're fictionalizing it to a degree, and bringing these exotic locations to the screen. I mean, we're hoping to get these little gems of stories that somehow we can bring to life. And I think Rapanui is clearly one of those stories. We want to take you to a place that you've never been, that you've never seen before show you a land and people that you didn't know existed. The look we're going for is epic. I mean, big. Monday morning, we're going to begin a film here that uh, will not be just a Polynesian tale. Hopefully, it will also serve as a parable for the entire world. Now, after 15 years, Kevin Reynolds' dream of telling the story of Rapa Nui is finally coming true. But bringing an international cast and crew that will number over 200 people, in addition to the supplies necessary to sustain this army for six months, without drawing from the island's own limited resources, will be a monumental task. The production will ultimately employ over 90% of the island's workforce in an effort to construct 32 full-sized moai create authentic Polynesian villages, and handcraft over 2,000 costumes. An ambitious undertaking for any film made all the more difficult when the location is a remote island 2,300 miles from anywhere. You have to really want to be here to go to the trouble of getting here. The biggest problem working on the island is, is its remoteness. I mean, when first they said, hey, we've seen the island, it looks great, maybe we can find another place to shoot, I thought, all right, well, let's, let's do that. This is an island that up until 20 years ago was in the 20th century. There was no electricity here 20 years ago. There was no air transportation 20 years ago, no telephones, no television, no news. There's only several flights a week, maybe two flights a week that even come onto the island. So when you need a piece, a lens goes down, a camera goes down, something like that, you have to go to Australia or go to Santiago. I mean, we're in the absolute middle of nowhere. You have to realize that the people here couldn't be expected, no matter how much you try and prepare them, 
to know what exactly was going to be in store for them to make a movie here. The filmmaker's impact on the life of the island stands to be as massive as the difference between the small moai, carved by today's island craftsmen from scraps of wood for souvenirs, to the giant statues carved by their ancestors. No less imposing is the task undertaken by production designer George Little in transforming modern Easter Island into its past stone culture. Little must recreate 32 full-scale statues as realistically as possible without actually carving them out of solid rock. Authenticity is what we're looking for in this film. The designs are as close to the originals as we can get them. Looking at the statues as they exist today, there's quite a bit of erosion, so you don't quite see the, the surface as it was. But there are a number that have been buried, and you can uh, see the, the textures and uh, the quality of the work. And the more you look at them, the, the more you realize they're great works of art and fantastic craftsmen who built them. Most of the 1,000 statues found on the island were carved from the soft volcanic tuff in the quarry at Ranu Raraku. They would start usually on the face of the statue. At that point, it was supposed to start representing this ancestor. And then they would continue on the front of the body in most cases, and then on the sides, cutting underneath, till the statue remained attached to the main rock by a keel that would run down its back like the keel of a yacht. Then they would perforate the keel so the statue was attached by a series of pillars of stone. And then they would place big beach boulders in between the pillars, cut the pillars, and the statue then would be lying on top of these round stones that would act as bearings. Then they would be able to move the statue around, slide it downhill into a hole that had been pre-dug, and then they would stand it up to finish the back, the shoulders, and the neck. The statues were status symbols of the different tribes and um, it was a very competitive society, so everybody was trying to have a statue that was larger than the neighbor. This point is taken to its extreme in the film, where the long ear chief's increased obsession with the statues forces the short ear laborers to build larger and larger moai. It's too small! Fortunately for designer Little, he could draw on the innate skills the island workers proudly carry as part of their heritage. The great boon to us was the, the local people and uh, the skills that they have in uh, their abilities to carve and build stone. They live with rocks all their lives, so I guess they, they know about them. Everybody on this island is a sculptor, practically. I mean, every male here is whittling away at a little moai in his spare time, and he's got a lot of spare time on this island. New Zealand artist Tony Lees, an expert in large-scale sculptures, was brought in to supervise the actual building of the Moai. Because of the tight production schedule, Lees used space-age materials and assembly line techniques to duplicate these ancient statues. Starting off with the marquette, the model, my process was drawing lines around the outside, transferring those to paper onto a grid pattern. Transfer that grid pattern up onto a floor, scale it up, recreate the line that you've drawn on the paper with the steel rod. Working very much like boat plans. Take all the steel rods, put them together in the matrix form, weld that together, cover it with wire and shade cloth, and uh, we foam them and shape the foam. You'd be going up to them going things like this, we should in a little bit, or, or this, you know, too big, push it in a little bit, or this here, push it up a little bit, you know. And it was, it was all done by sign language, a lot of it. But we, we got them fairly well right. An equal challenge was the manufacturing of more than 2,000 costumes for the lead actors and extras. Reynolds turned to Robin Hood costume designer John Bloomfield for the job. I mean, I'm actually astonished at the amount of work I've had to do on this film, um, when basically you look at the actors and they're all naked. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know why they're paying me. Bloomfield had the responsibility of creating two distinct looks for the long ear and the short ear clans. There isn't a great deal of, um, of real reference of, of uh, costumes of this period, because obviously they're all destroyed. But there are a lot of rock drawings which tell me what sort of patterns to use. And the shorties have got no decoration at all. They're very, very, very basic, very poor and very dirty. 
whereas the long ears, they're still pretty poor and dirty, but they're much more decorative. They've got feathers and they've got beads and they've got shells and they've got designs, paints and, and all that. Again, Bloomfield was able to utilize the island's vast pool of craftsmen. I have employed, I think it's 23 uh, local staff who are helping me. I mean, people who, who work in the craft industry, the tourist industry, who, who know how to use their hands. To achieve a realistic look, each costume had to be handmade from natural materials found only in Polynesia. Most of the clothes are made of bark cloth, tapa bark cloth, which you can still make on the island, but in such small quantities. The trees that are here are not big enough to make it in a big enough uh, supply. So I actually had to go to Tonga, and where they still have a thriving tapa industry. The island takes on a festival atmosphere as hundreds of local extras are assembled in full dress for the first time. For the people of Easter Island, it is a chance to take a step closer to their ancestors, one they will act out over and over before the cameras once filming begins. Jack, are you? <laughs> For Reynolds, it's a chance to make final costume and makeup changes before the pressures of the shoot divert his attention elsewhere. Now on hand are the principal actors, Hawaiian-born Jason Scott Lee will play Noro, the long-eared prince in love with the beautiful Ramana, Canadian actress Sandrine Holt. Isai Morales takes on the role of Make, the short ear Moai Carver. The supporting cast is led by George Hanari as the malevolent priest Tupa and the grandfather of the long ear clan, played by Eru Pataka Dues. Both performers are part of a core of actors made up from the native people of New Zealand, the Maori, a culture that shares a distinct connection with the Rapa Nui. The spiritual base of the Rapa Nui people is very similar to the Maori. The um, attitude towards the sea, towards the land, and towards the sky, which are spiritual. We all supposedly come from Hiva or Hawaiki Nui, Hawaiki or we this place where nobody knows where we came from. It's there's a Polynesian, very strong Polynesian connection. The language is very similar. <laughs> I have no difficulty being fluent in Māori in understanding Rapa Nui, providing it's the Rapa Nui that comes from the old people. In seeing us arrive on the island, they feel that there's a, a reconnection. At last they've got a real connection with Māoris and uh, brothers and cousins and whatever. As, in, as far as the film goes, I think they believe that they could do it themselves and perhaps if uh, the wider audience were all Spanish-speaking people, maybe that would fit. From the constantly crashing surf to the grassy inland plains and to the edges of dormant volcanoes, no one would disagree that the main character in the film is the island itself. And while Easter Island offered breathtaking backdrops for the film's action, numerous hurdles would have to be overcome to fully utilize the island's cinematic potential. Again, it's a cool situation where you got all this great stuff spread out all over the place, yeah. but you have to jump all over to yeah. put it into a sequence. Many of the sites Kevin Reynolds wanted to film are archaeologically sensitive, and before shooting could begin, he would need to obtain the permission of the islanders. They don't even want barefoot people out there, do they? You don't want your hand on it. No. You can't touch it. We can put our own rocks in and touch them. How about if we laminate the whole site? That's a great idea. It's archaeologically sensitive because the entire island is a museum. It's, uh, it's an island with a history that none of us, I don't think, really understands. You know the processional, when everybody's coming in? Any location the production wanted to use required the approval of Chilean and local officials to ensure the integrity and safety of the site. In the case of the film's quarry set, test drilling made by the production team led to the discovery of a second moai buried beneath this statue, and designs were altered to protect it. Whether you dig a piece of dirt or you dig uh, a foot of dirt or you carve a path, it means something to somebody because what's under the soil nobody knows about. 
A major occurrence in both history and in the film is the destruction of the island's palm forests. Utilizing a combination of real and fake trees, workers turned a barren hillside into a palm grove that will gradually be destroyed during the course of shooting. Part of the story of the movie is that uh, in building the statues, they cut down the trees to move the statues across the island, to brace up these statues, to uh, lever them up. And over a period of a thousand years, eventually denuded the island of trees. So it was necessary in the movie to create that. The producers have made a commitment to plant 300 new trees as their contribution to the restoration of the island's environment. Because of its proximity to nearby ruins, a far more challenging location to construct was the Longyear Village, an expansive set consisting of over 30 structures, with the focal point a large ahu, or altar, designed to support 13 of the film's moai. While great care was taken in the preparation of this site, local concerns were still being raised. Though not a deciding factor, a bit of superstition did play a role in obtaining final approval. A bird flew over, and it landed on the exact spot that Kevin Reynolds was talking about putting the actual ahu that we wanted to build. And Alberto Hotus, who was the head of the Council of Elders, walked over and stood next to the bird, um, probably the distance from me to you, bent over and petted the bird on the head. And these birds, you have to understand, these birds don't come around people. These birds are gone. They, they, don't, they don't come anywhere near us. Petted the bird on the head. The bird looked at him. The bird looked at us. The bird flew around in a circle, came back, and landed on the same spot. And Alberto Hodas turned to us and said, I'm sorry, uh, I was wrong. I think it's OK. This is a good sign. You can do your movie here. While the spirits of the island seemed to shine on the production at the start, no amount of planning or preparation could properly condition the cast and crew for the physical challenges the island would place on them once filming began. Rapa Nui is an extremely difficult film to make. It is probably some of the most hazardous locations I've ever been on. You want to die in the office? The Orongo Cliffs in particular were very difficult to get to. Just to walk down to the site where you'd base the cameras before you even went over the cliffs was a 30 to 40 minute hike down a, a very difficult trail with camera equipment and backpacks and things like that. And it takes us sometimes up to two weeks to see any of our footage come back. So it actually puts a lot of extra pressure on the crew to get it right the first time, because often you won't be able to go back to do it. I liked it, but I tell you something, it, it hurt, it, it hurt. Oh man, they never taught me this in acting school. No. You see, the hardest thing about this, when I would see dailies, I go, man, this is beautiful, but you have no clue in the film what it feels like. The water and everything looks really peaceful, but when you get into it, you get, you know, right in it, Nature can be it's really hazardous. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> oh boy. Is everybody okay? Oh, Excellent. <laughs> We're having fun now. It doesn't get better than this. The rugged terrain also provided a natural playground for a sport unique to Easter Island. Combining a steep mile-long slope with banana tree trunks lashed together. A tradition the islanders were proud to show off for the cameras. There's a thing called the banana slide that got you to confront a lot of fears. According to local lore, this is something they did since ancient times. And it was so crazy, so wild. I said, we've got to see this.
my character doesn't really have anything physical to do. Okay, I mean, like these guys uh, cliff climbing and diving and you know, swimming. So, as far as physical training, there wasn't, there wasn't any, except for maybe toughening up my feet. <laughs> Can I start all over again? I don't know. I'm not used to being in this type of surrounding. I'm used to like the city, you know, lots of people and lots of distraction. And sometimes it's hard because there is no distraction. You're just stuck with yourself. You just have yourself to face. And that can be difficult sometimes. With principal photography underway, the demands placed on the filmmakers by the island, combined with the cinematic opportunities it provided, made one thing clear. The scope and budget of Rapa Nui were growing daily. Producers Kevin Costner and Jim Wilson found it necessary to visit the location to determine whether a relatively small picture in its original inception was quickly becoming an expensive nightmare. And you, with your power, your energy, we're making connections. And together, if the rushes are anything to look at, it's breathtaking, it's stupendous, it's magnificent. It's my hope that the, anyone who would see this movie would see it for what it is, find its message, and be worthy of making the long journey to Rapa Nui. I mean, this is a solid group. We're going to make a good movie. And it's something all of us are going to be proud of. And we just like to say thanks for your vision and seeing the potential here, because not a lot of people would. The scope of the picture originally, I didn't think, was as large as now it has become. It's not only a cast now of three and a supporting crew, it's hundreds of extras. It's entire cities we're building. I never imagined that it would be this big, but it's turned into quite the epic. Anybody that will see the movie will appreciate why it was made there. We've gotten very good at the art of duplicating places, making places work. And this place couldn't be duplicated. In this instance, it was really the right place to be. We've opened the chapter on something that occurred on this planet. And the way Kevin filmed it will fire the imagination. North of Tahai, there's a cave mouth that's about, I don't know, 40 feet above the water. With this strong show of support, Reynolds is now free to focus all his efforts on the realization of his vision. He comes up over the left, he comes past camera. Heads up! Kevin Reynolds, I think, is one of the best, uh, what we call, I guess, shooters working today. And when we come into this, Steve, they'll be on the move yeah, and start this shot. Kevin loves shots. He loves all the material he can possibly get his hands on. He'll use every piece of the action from every angle for as long as he can, you know, so that he gets he gets the most out of it. Action! But he's very exacting. He knows exactly what he wants, and he really requires you to have a high precision of excellence. Touch! He did. <laughs> uh, I think it's time to check the gate. Not having really hung out around that many other sets and seen how other directors work, this to me seems like the only way to direct where you just jump in and you take an active part in the show. Now, Kevin Reynolds will ask his cast and crew to push themselves to the limits of their endurance. as they begin the filming of the island's most colorful and dangerous tradition, the legendary Birdman race. We're gonna have to go, man. Okay, I'll find it out. Stay by. Oh.
The entire sequence of finished film will last only minutes. Go, 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 go. I oh, know. But require weeks of shooting night and day with scenes involving every extra. In the final outcome, the patience and perseverance of everyone on the island will be put to the test. Stadium level. Turn it up. Turn it up. Based on fact, the annual event will decide which clan leader will hold the title of Birdman, the highest position of power on the island. Yeah, print that one. From high atop the cliffs of Orongo, across the water to the bird island of Motunui and back, the competitors and the actors who play them will face a grueling challenge of survival. This cult that uh, exists on East Rhino, the Birdman, is a very old cult that probably arrived here with the first settlers or the first migrations that came to Easter Island. The cult had a god that was called Makimaki. Maki. And this Makimaki Maki was supposed to send all the migrational birds to Easter Island every year. Members of these different warrior clans would send a representative down the cliffs to swim the channel at the Motunui to collect the first Monotara egg. And the first guy to get the egg and swim back and present it to his Lord and Master. That Lord and Master became the Birdman. Will you swim for me, the Arikimo, the reigning Birdman? Yes. The actual race took place over a couple of weeks, where they would swim out and wait on the island for the birds to come. Instead, we chose to compress it all into one day. We know the island that they swam to. We know the eggs that they went for. And take a bit of dramatic license from there to try to make it exciting. The race begins with a mad scramble from the Orongo volcano, out along a rocky ridge, and then down a 1,000-foot cliff. To get the shots the director wanted meant repelling cast and crew over the edge of the crater exposing them to unpredictable conditions that made safety the highest priority. A lot of that was just shot handheld off the side of a thousand foot cliff and got to some pretty good positions. And, and the good thing is the stunt team got the actors down there as well, so we managed to get some pretty hairy stuff, I think. Hands! Action! Stretch your teeth, stretch your teeth! I don't think I'll, I'll have to be confronted with a more difficult task than to, than to, to film on this island. The conditions, the cold, that I think no one really expected it to get this cold here. And being in practically a loincloth or g-string. If I trip, I could go totally over the net. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for the crew. They took good care of us, but there were times where you can't protect someone. Everybody okay? Yeah. If you step back, if you fall, you're dead. You're gone. Yeah, you get used to it, and you forget the precarious situation you're in. Occasionally, you have to turn and pinch yourself and say, I'm hanging off a 1,000-foot cliff. Uh, because surprisingly, you do forget where you are. Quickly. I didn't have to say, okay, now, you're on the edge of a cliff, okay, it, it, but this is not a sci-fi <laughs> movie where, okay, the giant is coming, he's crushing, you're going, oh, my God! It's a miracle. Things did not crash. We have a high fall into an airbag. As soon as I went, I just knew it was going to yeah. stay there. Yeah. Uh, which is quite high for the size of bag we had. And that actually went quite well. <laughs> Once of our stuntmen did a jump when he's supposed to look like he's going face first until just the last moment when he tucks and he goes into the bag. Then it was into the warm water in the channel between the Big Island and Motunui. 
the action can be seen close up thanks to a high-tech water camera mount. With the swimming sequence, we wanted it to look like you really felt like you were there with the actors in the water for the swimming race. So we built some rigs where we could, uh, we could do tracking shots in the water at swimming speed, you know, without, without the camera sort of jumping all over the place and making you feel seasick. But the churning waters on the jagged rocks of Motunui proved to be the most treacherous of all. Uh, the swell sometimes would shift uh, eight feet up and down, and you have to land with a boat and have to climb onto these uh, rocks. This was a location where, for one shot, a wave did come up and knock one of the actors off and scrape them up a little bit. Maybe I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was sort of like the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> Once on Motunui, the script called for the competitors to fight for any Manatara egg they could find. The problem is, the seabirds that used to breed there in large numbers no longer come. So the production turned to foremost ocean ornithologist Peter Harrison for help. You can go back into practically any civilization's uh, myths and legends, and birds have always had a very important uh, part in, in man's uh, mythology. And here on uh, uh, Rapa Nui, it is even more so. so. You just step back and let him go, and when he flies, our shot begins. Okay, so, okay. okay, I'll liven him up a little bit, though, just get his wings exercising, and then I'll put him down, okay. and he'll probably do it all himself. The all big right. problem was, how do we get birds back to this particular island? When we first came to this island, there were four resident frigate birds. By tossing fillets of fish out into the ocean, any passing frigate bird saw the four resident frigate birds of this island, the non-breeders, and they acted really as decoys, just like duck decoys. There was a, a surplus of food, and then from four we got up to eight, and then say 12, and then we had 15 or 16. Currently, after three weeks, we've got about 120 frigate birds that are actually roosting on this island. With the satisfactory number of well-fed birds to fill the sky, the director was able to focus on more important details. I can't see the egg. Cut! Cut! I think we got it. I have the egg! Are you lying? Though as difficult a location as any of Easter Island, Motunui would prove a minor inconvenience when compared to what awaited the crew back on top of the cliffs. Let's try and rehearse and start them right where they are there because the way it's going to operate is we're going to be up on that, see a group coming past, we'll tilt down, they're moving this way, you've got the bird figurine guys in front, then grandfather's litter, then Nora behind. So I think right about there should probably do it. Okay. Any film production requires communication that begins with the director and works through a chain of command down to the actors. Where the first person is on this group, okay? Now. When there are hundreds of actors, most of whom speak a different language than the director, communication can break down and frustrations can arise. A key! 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 A A key! I think a lot of the nuance is lost in between because you're trying to explain to an intermediary okay, I'd like them to do this, and if they don't pick up on that nuance exactly that you're going for, and they're trying to translate that to someone, especially someone that really has absolutely no previous acting experience whatsoever. Cut. Cut. Okay, what about the He's not putting the where he's supposed to. We've got the Issa Morales, who's one of our leads in the movie, to help uh, work as an AD, really, uh, getting a promotion out of the background extra. I knew that being one of the uh, you know, main actors, that they would pay attention. Being somebody who did not alienate them, being somebody who did not look at them as, you know, short ear type people, you know? <laughs> being a short ear, they identified, I, I felt. Nat says his line, and then he and Tupa exchange a look. 
All right, let's just try that before we even do the camera. Vamos a ensayar las reacciones ahora. La, cuando él diga acción, empieza, ah, no, y, y las reacciones, algunos van a ser contentos, algunos van a ser horríficos. As an actor, he understands the process, the mental process that you go through in trying to create a performance. So when he talks to people, he talks to them from the standpoint of someone who knows what it's like to try to pull those real emotions out of yourself. Sal ahí con coraje, dir tu life, he pushed them, y después bate y dile, yo nada, push my man. I wanted to give them emotional stimulus as opposed to technical stimulus. I think Kevin understood that. I think he appreciated a fresh approach and direction. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, Let's Here we go. Okay. I read the book. This. Action! Oh! With the understanding that filmmaking is a collaborative effort, a connection between the film crew and the Islanders is firmly cemented. And the mood of all involved reaches a peak as the extras perform one of their biggest scenes on top of Arango. But of all the obstacles confronting the production, the most frustrating was also the most unpredictable, the weather. Welcome to Rapa Nui, have a nice day. And the weather's just unlike any weather I've ever seen. I mean, you've got 2,500 miles of ocean either side of you, nothing that stops it. It just creates its own microsystem where people joke about the weather changing every 15 minutes, but here, literally, it does. having a great time. That's right. Wish you were here. Being on a remote island in the middle of the Pacific is much like being on a ship at sea, and you're subject to all these storms that pass through, and uh, some of them come through fast, and some of them linger for a while. Well, I must say, it, it's, it's really difficult in the, trying to judge what the weather's going to be like here. I mean, the times we've been filming on Rongo, and we've had brilliant sunshine, we've got back to base camp, and they said, oh, how'd the filming go? And we said, oh, it's great, yet all of base camp is totally underwater. It's like the island reads your mind and knows what it is you're planning to do, and decides to mess with you and thwart you. For the island extras, the rain is just a part of their everyday life and a perfect excuse to sing a song while all the crew can do is wait for the next break in the clouds. The hard thing about this show is anytime you make a film, you start out with a plan. Every day you, you say, okay, these are the shots we're going for today. This is what we're gonna do. These are the scenes we're gonna shoot. And on this show, invariably, you walk out the door with a plan and within a half hour if you get to set, it's out the window. These are the exact conditions the original islanders must have faced as they carried out their most remarkable feat, dragging over 230 statues to various altars along the island's coast. There were different legends. Some of the legends say that the statues were carried standing up, that the statues would walk to the altar. Uh, others suppose that the statues were uh, place on top of a large sled and then use rollers underneath to, to move them. But uh, probably they used all kinds of methods. Maybe small statues were transported standing up, very large ones sometimes lying down. We don't know. In the film, pulling the massive moai across the island to the Long Ear Village unites the short ears in a common purpose. So it is for the production, uniting cast and crew with the Islanders in a final push to complete the film. It feels unreal. It feels unreal. They had an actor more. You know? The real deal. 
was so much more heavy. The problems that we had in moving a hollow one. <laughs> they weighed 100 tons. So I can't imagine how those people did it for real. It was so difficult for us to do it with all our modern technology and three cranes. And they did it with stone tools. I don't know how they did it. I don't doubt that there may have been some external influence of some sort, you know, whether it be spiritual from within the people themselves, whether it be their religious drive, you know, some technology that we're not aware of today that didn't survive. But the thing I, I can tell you the most is that if we all pull together, <laughs> anything is possible. To me, it is beautiful to see one, two, three, and a three or a pull. Everybody has the same purpose. If we could only do that in the world, if we could only build symbolic moai for humanity, For the Islanders, it was a chance to recapture a moment from their past glory. I think they felt what their ancestors must have felt. You could sort of see it in their faces that a lot of them did. That they went, I'm doing, I'm doing what people were doing 20 generations ago. Maybe it was just for one take for 30 seconds or whatever, but I think they were really into it. But as all things must pass, so did the days of the Moai. Though the cause of the fall of the people who built them remains a mystery, there is scientific evidence pointing to a series of events beginning with the appearance of a celestial phenomenon in the skies above the island. Like in all the rest of the world, they had a Halley Comet on 1600. Then they had a whole series of eclipses between 1600 and 1613. I think there were six eclipses that were visible on Easter Island. Then after that, uh, there was uh, probably a Nino current. We have one at least a century. A Nino current is this uh, hot water current that comes all the way across the Pacific from Australia to the coast of South America. And uh, the last one that passed in 1962, uh, 63, it killed most of the vegetation around the island, I mean the algae, and the marine life practically disappeared. So if you had all these factors occurring at the same time that the island is running out of wood, you have a problem of overpopulation, food shortages, it would be natural that you would start doubting about the power of the gods. So uh, all these things would have brought chaos and uh, probably the abandonment of, uh, of the quarries here. Just have them burn it. The chaos comes swiftly, as depicted in the film, with a revolt against the long ears and the toppling of the Moai. sort of live the adventure coming to Easter Island. And with all the obstacles that were put in front of us, I think we've been able to capture the place and get some pretty spectacular stuff on film. That's a real feeling of accomplishment because a lot of people wouldn't have tackled it. A lot of people tell us we just couldn't do it. They may be right. We'll see. The impact the making of this film will have on the crew, on the islanders, and on the world is uncertain but no one that the film has or will touch will soon forget it. 90% of the people that have worked with us have felt that this movie was a good thing. The older people uh, that generally don't have a chance to get a job, to work, to earn money, have saved their money and they've bought refrigerators and clothes and have fixed their houses, uh, so that's good. More people will come here to the island 
And I think the majority of the people who live here, it will help them. I mean, their primary business is that of tourism. And so if tourism increases 20, 30 percent, I think that'll, that'll help the island. People will come here to find out for themselves exactly what they think the truth is of what happened here. And that may irreversibly alter this place somehow, because in a lot of ways it's very idyllic. And then another part of me thinks, well, that may happen for a year or so in response to the film, and then interest will drop off, and it'll go back to being what it always has been. Easter Island is adapting to the modern world, but at its own pace. Study and restoration of its archaeological sites continues, along with improvements to its public facilities. Interest from tourists and scholars will certainly increase. And today, the most remote inhabited place on Earth is accessible to the entire world. The events that took place on this tiny island are no longer so mysterious. The only real mystery that remains is whether we will learn from the mistakes made here and benefit from them. And as the present joins with the past, if there is one message the island, the film, and the filmmakers can convey, it is one of caution, care, and of hope. We just have this little space and time that we occupy the planet. For as bad as we are, we're trying to open our eyes. And this film uh, does that in, in the smallest and biggest of ways. As boys, they had been friends. As men, they would compete. If he loses the race... ...for the right to lead their people. This is our chance. You must help me do the impossible. ...and to win the woman that they both loved. How bad do you want to win? More than anything. Enough to see him sacrificed? Jason Scott Lee, Isai Morales, and Sandrine Holt... The strength of their passions would determine the fate of paradise. Rapa Nui 